we all uh, know how identity as has evolved to be the uh, center stone center pillar for um, anything in the financial services and in sort of any services in general especially in this digital era so it to, to talk to us on uh, identity as a foundation for the digitized services uh, jo joining us are <clears throat> Ramesh Narayanan, CTO of MOSIP, Modular Open Source Identity Platform, and Srikant Patil, CEO and MD at DigiAlly. Hi, Ramesh. Hi, Srikant. Hi, Prashant. Nice Thank background. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're just having the discussion and no slides, right? Yes, it's just a discussion. discussion. And, uh, right. Yeah. And we are open okay. to questions. Yes. So. Shikant, not able to hear you. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. So thanks, Prashant and Ramesh. Uh, such a pleasure to have a chat with you on this. And uh, this is a great topic. I think uh, you know, one of the things which is happening around the world, and uh, unfortunately, the reason for that is uh, not the favorable reason, but uh, we uh, still are moving towards digitization very aggressively across the world. And APIs are creating tremendous impact where organizations are able to create user journeys and create innovative products out of that. Now, one of the things we would definitely like to discuss, and you know, you did some very interesting presentation this morning about digital trust. So we will talk about digital trust. We will talk about some of the examples which uh, Mosip has been, Mosip has also implemented. Uh, but let me start with a brief introduction, uh, and you know, we'll continue with, uh, with that. Uh, so my name is Shrikant. I'm the CEO and founder of DGLI. DGLI is a Singapore-based uh, fintech. Uh, SFA certified fintech. We are also a member of Fintech Association of Hong Kong and we largely operate in the area of digital trust. Uh, in simple terms, uh, we look at digital identity and data privacy and we put that together and it's a plug and play platform. Uh, as part of my past experience, I have been a consultant with Boston Consulting Group, Accenture, Oliver Wyman, and IBM. Uh, happy to, uh, uh, you know, take any more questions as we go further. Uh, Ramesh, over to you if you could uh, introduce yourself. Sure. So uh, I am a technology entrepreneur. I have veteran, veteran of a couple of startups. Uh, I have been a big believer in technology as well as the India story. So been focusing on how to actually get technology to impact India. So both my startups were in the social space. First was in the uh, rural banking space. I tried to get banking technology uh, trickle down to towns and villages. So that was the first endeavor. The second one was an employability in the digital age, especially with our population going up and skilling becoming an issue. So preparing for jobs uh, was a focus. But uh, while this has been the focus, the underlying uh, thread has been technology, been building products and uh, in various sectors, telecom, banking, supply chain. And uh, now for the last uh, three years or so roughly, I've been with MOSIP. And this, is, this time, I think the impact is not just in India and global. Uh, so it's been an exhilarating journey so far. And uh, a focus is to see how to use uh, technology to transform people's lives. So and digital transformation is happening all over the world. And uh, happy to be in the right place at the right time. Of course, that's very important, right? And uh, I think digital trust is uh, very relevant today. Uh, we have seen that a lot of industries, including healthcare, ports, some of them were attacked 400 times, right? 400% uh, more. And uh, there's been a serious cyber risk which has been posed. A lot of organizations are like SMEs who never thought to look at digital or having access over internet now are forced to digitize, right? 
But all of this digitization brings in a lot of cyber risk. And uh, we've seen some challenges emerging out of that. And while you know there is a prediction that uh, there's going to be around 30 billion uh, dollar loss, uh, which is going to happen by 2030, uh, and we are going to face a lot of disruptions in the businesses. What have you seen with your clients or in the industry? And you said not only just India, but across the region. Uh, in terms of the cyber risk and what kind of threats you have been able to uh, observe? Uh, uh, the risk in this age actually comes from two perspectives. One is uh, poorly secured technology is open to hackers and they can make merry, right? So uh, whether it is denial of service attacks or using unauthenticated API endpoints for uh, gaming the uh, application, whatever it is, right? So people have a lot of time on their hands and then they try it. And uh, the tools are available now in the open for easily discovering loopholes. And so managing security at the enterprise level or at the application level has become very critical. So in fact, uh, I have not able to meet some of my cybersecurity friends because they are so busy uh, around the clock securing applications and dealing with crisis. Uh, and we need more of them. Business for them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's 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 important to get things right at the beginning, rather than try to plug holes later. Being proactive is important. The second aspect is uh, risk that comes due to lack of digital literacy. I have multiple times helped out people at ATMs. They just hand me their card and tell me their PIN number, which they read from a piece of paper and ask me to draw cash from their account and help them out. This, this is reality, right? And ATMs have been in vogue for decades now. And uh, moving to newer ways of uh, working is, is going to require sufficient education of people, right? And this is not something that can be taught once in school because it's a moving landscape. Security is always a moving landscape. So we have to figure out uh, ways of avoiding the risk in the first place and then adding education uh, of the masses in order to ensure that the risks are minimized. And finally, while these billions sound big numbers, they are a trickle, I mean, a drop in the overall economy. What has to be minimized is the impact on the individual because for them, the cost of a transaction, if they if they lose a lakh or, uh, so it's, it's big money for them, right? So it, it is, protection at the transaction level for the individual that needs to be also put in place. Fantastic. And, you know, you and I, we had been discussing about this digital in inequality, uh, you know, where the awareness is, lack of awareness or lack of access is causing a uh, different type of response or different type of leveraging digital. Uh, like a lot of senior citizens don't actually go on certain apps and book vaccination. Uh, in case of children, you know, uh, there are remote spot, parts of the world where uh, it was hard for them to have the infrastructure, uh, let in, you know, uh, just the, not just the internet, right, uh, to continue the remote learning, right? So there is, there is a digital in inequality which is also uh, aggravating the situation. Uh, so, so completely with you. Um, Moving on to one very interesting topic, which you which you discussed in the morning, and you know, I I would like to move a little further on that, is the definition of digital trust. And you know, let me, uh, you know, give you a little bit of context because you know, from DGLI perspective, we've also done a, a lot of work on what digital trust is, and you know, defining that. I would really like to have uh, your views on on that, but. Uh, just to take a step back and uh, talk about digital trust, uh, I think if you are able to solve uh, four problems, one is you know who you are talking to, right, which is the individual or the enterprise, you are able to identify them properly. Then the communication which you are having with them remains private, so which means that it is encrypted, uh, it is not uh, available to everyone uh, for for sniffing. Uh, also, there is a control from a data privacy perspective that, you know, if I want to only share certain part of my uh, personal data, be it an enterprise data or individual data, uh, we can share that. And 
the last component is the non-repudiation part of the transaction. That if I have shared this data with someone, someone has access to that, uh, you know, that data. So from a DGLI perspective, we're kind of looking at this as a digital trust, uh, as a as a unique uh, recipe, right? You know, if I can call it. Uh, but happy to have your view on uh, what do you define as digital trust, and at NoSIP, how do you how are you solving some of these uh, digital trust issues? Right. So definitions are dime a dozen, and uh, even though the terminology used is varying, more or less people agree with upon the key elements. Uh, they they're pretty much in line with what you said. In fact, what I talked about in the morning also talks about trusting the parties involved, trusting the channel, trusting the data, and uh, having governance, including on repudiation, redressal, and all. So if these are addressed, we are uh, pretty much addressing trust. But the way we look at trust is uh, always coming from first principles, which is by looking at who are the consumers of this trust and what they expect in terms of trust. So uh, assurance. Uh, a sense of peace, right? Uh, the fire and forget uh, mode of dealing with uh, transactions is what people really are looking at. So when uh, when it comes to dealing with trust, people would like to see that they are dealing with trusted parties. So ratings, trust marks, and all are good. So in a browser, when I go to a site, I get an alert for phishing, or uh, I can see that it is SSL secured. There is a green lock. So these things basically help build trust. To say that this somebody has put in the effort to check, and these guys are good guys to deal with, right? And we go through references in the real world. We ask for friends. Hey, is that a good place to buy furniture, right? So th that's how we uh, look at trust. So we also are looking for recommendations and somebody who's evaluated. So trust comes from uh, assurance provided by somebody about the parties involved. So are the individuals, are the enterprises verified? And they are who they claim to be. So that is uh, one thing that uh, spawns a lot of comfort. The second thing is security, as you said, right? The data is encrypted. Nobody is going to hack the transaction, change the amount, or reroute the financial transaction to a different bank, and so on. So these uh, this comfort, and if something goes wrong, they need somebody to have their back because mistakes do occur. Uh, today, uh, I think that is where there is a big lag. Uh, redressal and recourse has never been easy uh, in the real world in banking and finance. And in the digital world, it's even more difficult because you have to talk to a faceless person over the phone and maybe a long wait. It's quite frustrating. So I think putting fraud management systems in the place, proactive action, easy recourse, reversal of transactions. These these are all also, uh, and transparency in the whole activity, right? Uh, that is going to bring a lot of comfort to the people. So if people are comfortable using systems, that is coming because of trust. And so we have to look at how to bring comfortable, uh, I mean, that comfort uh, to enhance trust. Oh, very, very well articulated, Ramesh. Thank you very much. And you know, when we talk about open banking, uh, it essentially is not just open banking, it's also about open finance, where our financial life is available and accessible different or uh, different digital part of digital life, as well as open data, right? So we can also have uh, certain other data, which is like energy data or entertainment data, any other part of our digital life data is also available and open for this. Now, when we talk about open open banking or all this entire open data, open finance dimensions. Uh, we've been talking about largely, you know, digital identity, from my perspective, uh, has been misunderstood by a lot of people that it is limited to individuals, right? Uh, that, you know, uh, it's just giving identity to one person. Uh, hey, Prasanna, hi. Welcome, Prasanna. Can you hear us? I'll, I'll continue. Prasanna, can you hear us? So uh, let me complete. So, you know, the part of digital identity which is misunderstood is only like applicable to individuals. You know, people by default miss, uh, you know, the concept of having digital identity for enterprises, digital identity for 
APIs, digital identity, you know, for Internet of Things, right? Uh, so from an open world, right, and we are moving towards it, a lot of regulations are coming in. Uh, how can we actually have uh, this address uh, of, of not giving identity only to individuals, but also to a larger spectrum of things, right? So we'd like to hear from you, uh, Ramesh, in terms of Mosif. New one. Hey, Prasanna, can you hear us? So uh, this is a question that we get often. So, Mosep has limited its focus to providing identity to persons. Not that uh, we don't feel the need for identity for others. Uh, so uh, what we see is that there are registries of businesses, there are registries of vehicles, there are registries of properties and so on, right? So uh, the job of various registries is to actually give identity. So and some of them have to be foundational registers with legal backing, right? Uh, so foundational identity for individuals is what we offer. Foundational identity for businesses and other properties can also be backed by legal agencies who give uh, credence to these IDs. So it's it's very much a requirement and need of the art. And digital transactions are not risk restricted only to individuals, but businesses, even systems talking to each other can uh, perform transactions. We had people talking about algorithmic trading and so on. But at the end of the day, if you look at it, most businesses are represented and operated by people. Even systems represent people. So people identity would end up being associated with business identities also, like the directors of a business and so on. So we are we are heading towards a complex, like you know, a, a, a way of representing identities and not only representing identities for individuals, enterprises, but also creating linkages between them, right? Because at the end of the day, when you're dealing with a company, the reputation of company is also defined by the people who are who are running it. Right? So uh, I think that's that's a very very important point. Uh, question to uh, you know, both of you and Prasanna can hear us. Um, in terms of the open banking, would be happy to hear, uh, you know, both of you would have actually spent a lot of time on uh, open banking and, you know, identity and enabling open banking, right? Uh, so what are the case studies or, or any specific areas where uh, you are able to add, uh, you, you are able to see a lot, tremendous attraction and, it's not just related to India. Uh, you know, it, it could be in Southeast Asia. It could be across across the world, right? Uh, and and for me, you know, I have been uh, looking at some of the corporate side of open banking, and now uh, you know that's also opening up big time. Where organizations are, banks are connecting to ERPs, banks are connecting to the external uh, sources uh, where you could exchange data. You know, send financial statements, supply chain. Uh, invoicing is becoming, uh, you know, supply chain finance is becoming very interesting for uh, open banking use case. So all of those are are, are really exciting. But I'm, I want to see, uh, you know, what you are observing in, in the market and where clients are seeing, uh, asking for a lot more traction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, you yeah, so I think okay. uh, Srikant, I think uh, uh, very good question. I think uh, good to be here with you and uh, Ramesh. Uh, I thought it is in the evening. Uh, maybe you are sitting in Singapore. That's how is the time gap. So uh, sorry for the delay uh, joining in. Uh, I think open banking is a uh, open banking. At times we talk uh, upon uh, API banking or uh, uh, these days we keep on hearing like open finance or embedded finance. I think quite a lot of traction around these areas. And uh, if you see uh, any of those uh, uh, traction in the Indian banking or outside of India, I think many uh, many countries or many uh, uh, are really created standard around open banking. Say, example, in European Union, we have a PSG guidelines in Hong Kong or in Australia or in Canada, like uh, countries. So they have their standard open banking, with, which is well supported by regulators or governments and they have relevant use cases on there which is relevant to that country now coming back to india context i think uh, every bank has its own had its own journey on uh, api banking uh, and we treat it as an open banking so on 
typically it has started by opening some payment uh, kind of APIs like IMPS or NFT, NFT APIs. Uh, we're in a bank like S Bank or uh, SBI or SDFC, Indusind. We have seen Kotak giving their APIs and even DCP. Uh, in the, since I think it has been in a in a in a always in a new like since 2015-16 and so on. I think post demonetization we have seen uh, more of a collaboration between fintech or uh, those wallet kind of a companies wherein they were always depend upon uh, APIs from the bank. So the journey was like for every bank it has its own journey how many APIs they do have, right? Moreover, it starts from whether they do have any kind of people in the bank, right? If the right governance structure is there or not. That's banks as a lot for creating a governance structure or reskilling internal people uh, uh, or having those backend system availability, enterprise service bus. So I think there could be hardly 20, 25 banks only in India out of the several banks, which has a uh, linear which supports open bank API banking. Being enterprise service by some partners like uh, uh, IBMs or Red Hats or uh, uh, and so on, or Kipco and so on. on. And on top of that, API banking kind of infrastructure which helps to uh, create those APIs on the fly as well as uh, view those APIs relevant uh, parameterization on some platform where FinTech can come and practice it. And later on, FinTech can come in and come and really utilize it. And the monetization, parameterization, it always happens on API banking platforms. So every bank has its own journey so far. We talk about RBL or uh, DCB or uh, and so on. So uh, in uh, in uh, in 2017, when we uh, UPI, which is one of the landscape changing exercise where APIs or other SDKs are opened up to the uh, uh, open web banks as an ecosystem. Thanks, thanks, person. Very later on, phone panels or backend systems by uh, banks, right? That is one of the example of uh, API or one of the example of open banking, wherein we are giving our APIs or SDK. Another could be like complete. Uh, 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 another example could be complete platform like Ola platform coming inside a uh, Kotak uh, Banks app or or uh, Ola something which is going into inside or over going inside Google Maps, right? So, uh, so coming back to your original question. Every bank has its own journey to build open banking or the architecture and people part around that. But success is around how regulator is helping the overall initiative, how various use cases are coming in our life, which will really help to the end user and mass end user. It is not just like a one bank, which is a tech savvy bank opening their APIs. And these APIs are only available to some fintechs and relevant customers, not reaching to the mass customers, in, which is like a financial inclusion part or a, Many other uh, use cases like SME, wherein most of the customers should be utilized. The way we have data in Aadhaar or GSTN or many of those ecosystems, how that data can be utilized to provide a much more needed use case. There, I think, just like UPI, what we have done, account aggregator is an another uh, ecosystem which is coming in our life, where I think seven, eight banks are already doing POC pilots. And that will give a right structure to India. And later on, maybe down the line, three, four years, once we have right governance, incentivization, right uh, uh, API standardization, wherein I am part of account aggregator API group, wherein a lot of traction is happening so that today a fintech goes to a bank A, B, C, D, he should not struggle with the integration again and again. Once he has done integration with some use cases with account aggregator, where in a backend account aggregator getting data and those things from a bank or GST or any of those entities will come into picture. So example, banking is concerned. I think that will give a very, very not only banking use cases, may mutual fund and many more other instruments, wealth instruments will come, come under, under the game. Then I think other countries look at account aggregator as a very prominent and a standardized ecosystem, the way UP has done or the way Aadhaar is being there, right? So I think that, that's how India is looking at it. There are other examples like EU has done or somebody else has done, but the, the way account aggregator is being architecture, it is, I think it will be father of all the ecosystems because we are sitting on huge data. We are sitting on many ecosystems within a, within India, right? And we are seeing that those ecosystems should be integrated in a such a way that end user should be uh, benefited out of it with Fantastic. the right Thank SME and so on. So maybe I'll stop here. Maybe we can uh, take inputs from Ramesh and uh, move on. Yeah. Yeah, so we are running short of time, uh, Ramesh. We have one more minute. Uh, 
uh, it could address that, uh, or it could also look at the question which is about the developer that will be useful. We can, I think, uh, Prasanna has shed a lot of light on that. We could look at the next thing. So uh, I, I see a question about how MOSIP APIs can be used. So uh, MOSIP is being deployed in Philippines, Morocco. So every country which is deploying MOSIP would have these APIs available in their ecosystem. So that is one way of accessing. Second is MOSIP is modular. You can take some of our components and then uh, bundle them with your solution. So we encourage people to build MOSIP bundles. And as part of that, you could basically enable this same API uh, capabilities in other applications. So we have, uh, for example, our uh, core ID repository and a credential issue system and authentication of credentials. So if you want to have credential support and identity verification, you could just take these modules. If you want to run authentication on top of any existing database, we have an integration mechanism. You could use that and integrate it and expose it using standard APIs. So these are all open to developers. It's completely open source. And anybody who wants to build solutions, we also help them out uh, in terms of architectural and design guides. Fantastic. So just to quickly summarize, I, I think this was a very good discussion and just getting a segue to saying identity as a foundation for us to move towards open world, because then we can trust people as well as trust the enterprises. And as Temasek has been planning around a billion identities by 2025 in the region, uh, including both, yes. uh, we, we believe that it will it will become a huge uh, initiative across different regions of, of this world. But thank you to both of you uh, for, for a wonderful discussion. I really appreciate you. Thanks, Srikant. Uh, thanks, Prashant, John, and the thank API you, Days Shrikant. team for having us. I think yeah. Srikant, just Thanks, to add in the yeah. last uh, uh, 10 seconds, I think we'll touch base with you and really see how we can work on digital identity part, which is going to be a, a like a, a part for every device, every human being, right? So that's how we look at when IoT or 5G will come into reality, where blockchain or AI will prominently create a very good ecosystem where we will have a digital identity will not be just like a, some identity sitting in Aadhaar, but those will be on the fly identity, right? Wherever I go, I carry my identity and I'm a owner of that identity rather than some other database or some ecosystem is owner of that. So that's how even it goes with the machines and devices also. So I think uh, good discussion, Srikant. Thanks for the inviting here. Although I couldn't participate in the initial part, but it's a journey. Let's be in touch. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, care, Prasanna. Thank I think we, we are open, right, <laughs> to conversations. Yeah. Please feel free to reach out uh, to us, any of you, I am I am available at Ramesh at Mosul.io. Please feel free to reach out to continue the conversations. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ramesh, Shikant, Prasanna. We'll be taking a short break now. Um, we'll come back on this the enterprise stage and we'll continue with the connected services theme. Uh, first on the connected services uh, will be a panel discussion on the digitization of Indian financial services. And uh, during this break, uh, the break will join back at 3 p.m. India time. So it's around 27 minutes to go. So please do visit our partner booths. Uh, you have uh, there is a treasure hunt going on by uh, organized by our partners and uh, you will get a chance to win 30,000 rupees worth of gift vouchers. Thanks a lot.